Hello, everyone, and welcome to How Regular Dam Health Checks Can Steer Long-Term Dam Success. If you happen to be looking for dam, please meet commerce, commerce, please meet dam, you need uh, to get to know each other better. Just head back to the agenda tab and click on track two. Uh, and now we want you to put our expert panelists to the test. So please send us your questions in the Q&A tab at any point throughout the session and join in the conversation. So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Christina Hoodart. I'm an independent dam consultant um, and I have a funny accent because I'm actually based in London. Uh, this is where my dam uh, career started, but I'm originally from the US. Um, so for those of you joining on the good morning uh, from, from the US um, and for any of you joining from the Pacific Coast, uh, very early good morning to you as well. Uh, and some of the things that I've been involved in over the past nine years in my dam career are helping companies to select and implement their dam systems, change management and user adoption. And the latest and, and something that's really exciting is um, helping companies to uh, optimize their operations. And that's what we're talking about today with a health check. Christina, thanks for the chance to be here and to join yet another great Henry Stewart event as we continue to always want to rise the tide of what DAM can do and, and how DAM can work effectively. That's very much the tone of what our conversation is today. As a few of you might know, my name is David Lipsy and through utterly no technical skills, but a great good fortune, I wandered into this field when it was just getting started and I'm delighted to serve as chair of many of the Henry Stewart events and to join projects and initiatives worldwide to advance how DAM goes to work every day and does good things. And then very much in that thesis, uh, we put this presentation together and welcome chance to be here. All right, and before we introduce our panelists today, um, we wanted to just do a quick introduction to what is this, this thing called a dam health check and how does it work? Um, so this is what brings us here today. And when we think about a health check in our daily lives, you think about when you start to be, feel a little bit out of kilter. Um, so I've noticed, for example, that my fitness stats have gone down. I've got an ankle injury right now. Um, and so, you know, I'm noticing these little symptoms and little issues going on in, uh, in your daily life. And that's kind of the point when you, you say, okay, I'm, I need a health check now. And the same happens with your dam. So you might be looking at monthly or quarterly dam reports, and they might be showing things like this, a thing called a dam health check and how does it work? Um, so this is what brings oh. us here today. And when we... Just one second while Christina restores a little <laughs> audio hiccup there. Sorry about that. That's okay, um, you're back. Apologies, had an echo. Um, all right, so yeah, you may start to notice some symptoms in your dam reports that you're running regularly. Things like if the searches um, or downloads suddenly dip, uh, maybe new content isn't going into your dam system. Maybe another part of the business actually purchased another dam system or something that does something a little bit similar. And now you're not really sure which tool to use for what. These are all common symptoms that uh, we hear from the dam industry regularly. And that's when you realize it's time to take that step back and do a holistic dam health check. Um, sorry to say, maybe your test results are back and we have some metadata efficiencies here. We've got some new unmapped processes over there and a lack of governance over which new use cases to take on next year. Today is the time when we talk about the health check and, and we're going to prescribe you some vitamins and supplements um, that you're going to be able to use to give your dam that extra little boost. And there are a few reasons why 
we recommend doing a health check. Um, and that's firstly to assess the current state of your dam. Where are we now? Uh, what have we accomplished? And this is usually maybe kind of two to five years into having a dam system. You might say, you know what? We implemented it originally for this purpose, but what are we using it for now? And we know that dam evolves over time. And so this is something to keep a, a regular check on. We also do a health check so that we can make plans for what's next in our dam journeys and to prioritize the strategic business value in our dam roadmap. Does our, our dam still align with the strategic objectives uh, for this year, maybe for next year and, and in, in five years for our business? And let's say if your company is starting to get into e-commerce or getting a bit deeper into e-commerce these days, um, but you haven't thought about integrating your dam with PIM tools, yet. Maybe if any of you heard Megan speaking earlier from Edrington, you'll know how important this is and how if you haven't done these sort of integrations yet, there might be a disconnect. So doing a health check is that time to regroup and imagine the possibilities and opportunities with DAM and really to realign your DAM roadmap with your long-term shared DAM vision to make sure that you're doing the things necessary to achieve that vision. All right, now over to David to share one framework that you can use for your next dam health check. Christina, thanks for that. In 2012, a group of professionals came together, myself, Teresa Regley and others, and created what was then called the Digital Asset Management Maturity Model. There is a, a long and, and wonderful uh, series of um, I guess what we call this, there's been a long and wonderful studies about how maturity models, which we now call capability models, go to work and provide us with a set of common objectives to measure ourselves against. So when we think about a health check, one of the things in DAM that's all over the map is how reporting works from various DAM systems and quite commonly with third-party tools that are used to report out on DAM. We recognize the need to provide a different approach to this that would be standardized and kind of set a deep keel against which we could find out, we could assess where we are with them today, uh, measure our progress against industry stated objectives and standards for how DAM should be working, and then use this tool also to get a sense of how do we move forward if we're in a point of stasis, a point of success, a point of curiosity or a point of frustration. And our version of this today is called the Digital Asset Management Capability Model. It can be downloaded under Creative Commons at CASDAM, C A S D A M.com. And the model is an one approach to doing a health check. The model contains all the various things that DAM does from a a measure of, we'll call it kind of getting going to optimization across four key categories, organization, information, systems, and processes. These different, uh, these four categories contain facets of what does DAM do? It has use cases, it has metadata, it has to attend to rights, it has to attend to the technical and the human talent that's involved with DAM. And it's one approach to doing a health check. It's a wonderful tool. It's designed to be used collaboratively and with your team. And it's available to all uh, to use as a possible approach to a health check. Christina? Thank you, David. And I've popped the link for the capability model into the chat. So if anybody wants to take a, a look at that, um, it's, it's really useful. All right. And now without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, so we'll start with Alan. Well, good morning or good afternoon. Um, and thank you, Christina and David, for inviting me on this panel. Uh, this is a subject dear to my heart. Um, I am currently a director of product marketing for DAM at Highland uh, Nuxio. 
And uh, prior to that, uh, I was doing some consulting, uh, a bit like you, Christine, uh, Christina, sorry, not enough coffee this morning. Um, <laughs> um, so I was doing some, Dan, some intelligent content consulting, which Dan was central. And I've also actually been a practitioner in running a DAM program and a DAM team at various global brands as well. So sort of been across the DAM spectrum. So uh, actually looking after a DAM platform and how it's, you use it is something that's very uh, close to my heart and uh, some experience around. So looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Alan, for joining us today. And uh, Conrad. Uh, hi, Christina. Hi, hi, David. Thank you for inviting me along. Uh, and, and it's great to be on a, um, on a panel with, um, you know, I haven't got as great a history in this industry as, as David or Alan has. And I know, you know, Christina, we've pretty much gone through this journey together in the last few years, but it's it's great to be included in this crowd. Uh, so I'm I'm currently the um, product marketing manager for DAM at, at OpenText. Uh, I've been in that role for just over two years now. Um, for the previous 10 years, I've been a, a DAM practitioner, uh, the last few years of that as a as an independent DAM consultant. Um, and I've um, I've implemented or or helped with the implementation of uh, of several um, uh, brands, particularly yeah, here in here in the UK, uh, notably uh, Kingfisher. So that's the retail group that runs um, a lot of home improvement companies across Europe, uh, Canon Europe, and and Marks and Spencer. Uh, so I've been involved with um, a, a number of implementations, working with different partners uh, to, um, to to deliver results for uh, for um, for you users and for the business. So really happy to, to discuss this subject today. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm just going to stop my screen share now and, um, and then we can see all of your lovely faces. Um, so I'm really excited to be welcoming this group today for this chat because um, you've just heard they have an incredible experience not only as end users having worked in directly with brands and in uh, being on the business side in brands but uh, Conrad and Alan and David um, all have vendor experience as well so you get to see how a dam works and uh, different perspectives um, when you're on the different sides of, of the dam industry. So brilliant to, to have all of you in this chat. So we've talked a little bit about the importance of brands running a, a regular health check on their dam practices, covering everything from people, process, data, and technology. Are there any other elements that you would recommend that should be included in a, a dam health check? I'll start with you, Conrad. Yeah, I think, I mean, they're, they're pretty wide categories and it's probably um, a more like a, a detail within one of those categories. But I think the, in terms of like a yearly or, or, or less frequent health check, I think something um, you've got to do is actually look at the dam within the context of the wider business. See how that wider business has changed since you put the system in uh, or since your last health check. You know, the, the business might have, might have grown in different directions. There might be new markets that it's trying to, trying to address, uh, new departments that didn't exist when you last looked. Uh, there might be programs, you know, a, a digital program, some kind of replatform program going on uh, that that you need to need to be part of, really. Uh, and you know, the the entire objective of the company might have changed in some way. You know, the companies will will. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I, I actually um, uh, talked with um, uh, with a business leader from my uh, one of my previous um, uh, clients, uh, Kingfisher. Georgina is actually on the other track right now, um, talking about the, on commerce, um, and you know, the whole reason for bringing in a dam initially was centralizing content creation for all of these different brands across Europe, and now that objective has changed to making it more about localization and locally created content. So the actually the objective of the dam had changed over that time period. So I think that's a really important thing to understand and 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 include in that in that health check. Brilliant. I love hearing that, the strategic elements of it and looking beyond just the dam, right? So yes, it may, we might call it a dam health check, but it's not just about the dam. Alan, what experience have you had with this? I was actually pretty much going to say the same thing as Conrad. Uh, he's very much uh, picked up uh, on 
my experience. What I've always used as a guide is a, a great acronym that, that Forrester put together. I think they put it together actually as part of a social media, building a social media network. I think it really applies to any content driven activity, um, which is the idea of post, which is people, objectives, strategy and technology in that order. You think about the people, you think about the objectives, you think about the strategy, then you apply the technology. Um, and I've always used that as the guiding post for when we do on any content system um, and, and Dan in particular um, is looking at those. And I think often to Conrad's point, the two in the middle, the objectives and the strategy sometimes get overlooked because um, we, get, I, we get focused on what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, on a tactical basis. And sometimes the business will evolve. Um, and sometimes businesses do like a complete 180 or they go off in a completely different direction um, very quickly, particularly these days. Um, you know, we've seen it with a lot of our retail customers who have on the had a Nuxio side who've had to really pivot towards online retailing, being online retailers when they were very traditional brick and mortar stores. Um, and their objectives have changed the way that they want to put content out there, how they use their content, how they use their imagery has changed very quickly. So um, if you just put the dam in to do one thing and the business changes around you, the dam can very quickly become irrelevant. So you really have to think to Conrad's point about how it fits within the wider enterprise and make sure that when you're doing these checks, whether you do them annually, quarterly, whatever, that you're actually also thinking about what are the objectives of the business? Are we still aligned with that? And what's the strategy for actually delivering those objectives? And how does the dam contribute to that? So. Yeah. Alan, I think that's a, a really interesting phrase that you just used about the dam can become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you and Conrad could comment on what are some of those faint signals that you're, look, you're both seasoned advanced professionals in this field, and we've all been through circumstances, and the two of you have been involved in the opportunity from, and one of the reasons I value your role in the industry was because you've been on both sides of the proverbial desk. And <laughs> right. so I'd like, well, I'll start with you because you raised the point, but about what the faint signals where, you know, the insects just crawling on the edge of the spider web <laughs> uh, and uh, that some things are going amiss um, because we don't ever want them to be irrelevant, particularly in an era where a digital twin is born for every object, so. Right. Um, I think sort of Christina hit on one of them earlier on when she said that, uh, you know, maybe somewhere else in the organization, they've, they've put in a tool that does something similar to that, yeah. but not quite down. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen that quite a few places where, you know, um, we've got a PIM system that maybe manages images, but it's not doesn't do it the way a dam does. Or we've got a CMS and we can put our images in the CMS uh, and you've got, you start getting the content starts getting fractured across the organization and the man management and content. And then also you start seeing breakdowns in things like taxonomy um, and how things are called, you know, uh, across the organization. Um, I, I've always been a strong believer that there should be somebody in the organization who has a holistic view of content across the organization. Um, even if they don't control it, at least somebody who keeps an eye on it um, from a, a librarian point of view, a, where are we storing stuff? How are we using it? Where are the you know where are the images coming from on the website? Where are the images coming from on the packaging? Where are the images coming from on the digital signage? Um, and sort of keeping an eye on that and trying to be aware that when things start a fracture. Um, so for me, some of the warning signs are some of the things that Christina talked about. You know, people getting other systems in there that sort of do pseudo dam but not really dam. Um, it, it starts getting harder to find stuff because people aren't putting in the right metadata or that nobody owns that anymore. Um, things like things like that. Um, you know, down the that you've seen a trend in the you know downloads dis, you know, just trending downwards because people are just not using the dam. Um, so. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely on the button there. Um, yeah, th there's the obvious things to look for, like a decline in the number of users, or particularly the decline in number of new users being being onboarded, uh, and and downloads. 
Um, I, th I think my my terror um, scenario is when you're called into a you know a company <laughs> announcement and they and they say oh we've just we've just launched this wonderful new digital initiative where we're going to be doing X Y and Z and you realise you weren't involved in it at all even though it's got all of you know it's it's using the imagery that you would normally handle um, but they haven't they haven't come and talked to you and you know that they're not using your system so that's that's like the terror scenario and that's it probably at that point late um, because that's gone through all of the governance levels hopefully uh, and nobody has said oh that's right the, strategically we're supposed to be putting all of our imagery of that kind into this system we should work with those so if it's if it if you've just if they just glided past that decision to launch something new without considering you yeah you you're you're being irrelevant there for sure mm. yeah I mean, good reporting can definitely help you out with a lot of things there, and um, that's yeah, that's probably another area where you can say, is our reporting meeting the objectives? Is it letting us know what other people are doing, uh, and is it uh, are we able to by using that reporting let the business know how they're doing? Uh, so putting in reporting and evaluating whether that reporting is uh, still meeting the needs is is important for all of those reasons. Mm. It's interesting that you say that, Conrad. I, you know, I've seen examples where the reports are being run, but because there's not that one person who's really able to interpret what the reports mean and what those symptoms indicate or signal, um, they can get lost. And, and Alan, to your point about having one central person with a holistic view over content. Um, something interesting that David and I have seen as well in, uh, with a recent client was um, a role in, on the technical side uh, called the, I think it was something like the head of um, digital capabilities, which is similar in the sense that it's a holistic view of um, what are the capabilities in the business right now, which which tools do we have where and how are each of them working? Um, and I think that's absolutely fascinating. And I think you've, you've both touched on something that, um, you know, you, you have those symptoms, but there's also uh, in a, on the longer term scale, there's the ability for digital maturity to actually go backwards and regress in a way. Um, and sometimes you see this uh, with your end users and, do you have any examples of where you've seen that happen and how did you help them get back onto track? Um, maybe I can take a, a run at that. Um, yeah, I've certainly seen um, customers, um, particularly more in my consulting days where they implemented a technology and then they built so many other processes around it. Again, it goes back to the objectives and strategy and not thinking about that. They, they put in a system and then they build so many processes about it and the process become really institutionalized and ingrained to the point that where actually they can't even upgrade yeah. the, the core cost mm -hmm. because they built so much around it. Um, so, and then they, they you know, I, I always have this, my, my wife works in local government, God bless them. Um, and, you know, some, some of the systems that she shows me, she, 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 she still uses, you know, still have green screen. Um, user interfaces because so much has been built on top of it that they, they really can't replace it. And they're not quite at the stage where they have to have, still have floppy disks, but you know, they're not that far off. Um, so I, I see that I've seen that sort of thing. And really in terms of helping, again, it comes back to, you know, what are the business objectives? What are you trying to do? Um, are you doing stuff just because you've always done it that way? Um, and really finding out where there are business issues. This is always the way I approach these things. Where's a business issue we can apply new technology to solve, build a program around that, prove the benefit, and then start doing the migration. Don't just do migration for the sake of migration. And again, that comes down to change management as well. Um, but fig figure out where you can solve a problem in the business by moving to the newer technology. Um, and then look at how you then you can sort of do a, a, a phased approach of modernizing um, but just coming in and say we're going to throw away the old system when it's become an integrated part of the organization is a very difficult sell it's much easier to say we can help you solve this business issue why don't we put a next generation dam in and show you how we can do that and then we can look at better ways that we can build the solutions you need in a way that can be future-proofed rather than developing into into a sort of sealed box as it were 
it, because you know if the business if the business doesn't change its attitude then yeah. if they do rip and replace in three to five years time they're going to be back in exactly the same situation right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. they're going to they're going to go through phases of being stuck for, you know oh it's new and then we're doing the same thing for five ten years yep. and then oh it's new we're doing the same thing for five ten years yeah exactly yeah, yeah. You, you just see a um uh, a, a, a steady increase in complexity yeah. and usually without without the governance to say how does this hold us back uh, and yeah that that's yeah I, I, you know, very similar experience to Alan where you just go in somewhere and you see that either a process or a, a, um, a, a data type or something is just so incredibly complex that they nobody even understands it anymore and they just have to let it let it run um, and just hope that it's working right. Um, so avoiding getting in that situation is really important. It does usually take years to develop. So, you know, if you catch it early, you're probably you're probably in a good good state. But yeah, it it blocks you from doing upgrades of the of the core application, um, and that means you're losing out on all of the development, all of the innovation that the engineering people have um, have, have been working on at the vendor over that time. You're probably paying way more for support than you would have otherwise because there's intensely complex models. So it's about creating some simplicity, creating something that's sustainable, um, building using you know, frameworks and extensions that means that they aren't reliant on the system being exactly the same tomorrow as it is today. Uh, so trying to create that kind of, that kind of situation is, is the way to you know, have, a, have, a, have a dam that's for life, not just for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I like Conrad, that I, <laughs> yes, yeah, Conrad. I think you 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 included in in that in your in what you just shared with us one little quick phrase that we, maybe we'll tease out a little bit, and that's you mentioned the phrase a new data type, mm -hmm. and we do live in a kinetic, unchanging, unpredictable digital environment. A few years ago, there was a technology invented called base hologram that got well known for having a, a holographic injection of a performer into live uh, orchestral, orchestrated performances. And uh, Roy Orbison was the first, basically the first kind of R&D with that. Um, Base hologram has continued to grow. And this past week, there was a lot of coverage of the new Whitney Houston concert that brings Yes, Whitney Houston, who's no longer with us in corporeal form, into a holographic form. And these are sold out performances. They're remarkable in their cadence with the authenticated experience of the original artist who's being portrayed. And they are just replete with the new data type issue. And it hits issues of scalability, something I sometimes call whatever happened to Pluto when we find a new, another little digital planet out there, it's like, oh, what are we gonna do about that? And if I really enjoy for the two of you to comment on looking at sort of systems and processes, sometimes it's workflow scalability, when we're in this kinetic changing dynamic environment and we know that's not gonna change. Yeah, I, I think I actually wanna go back to the holograms because you were the one who really opened my eyes to that and I really went and did some research around it. So thank you, David. That was, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we store something like that in, in, a, in a dam? You know, is, is, it a, is it a digital asset as we traditionally think about it or is it code? Um, is it something that we store a file or we store a compound of stuff? Um, you know, I think this is where we need, to, we, start, we need to start looking at are our systems, how are our systems storing that data? Are we storing them as objects or are we storing them as intelligent pieces of data or, um, you know, are we thinking of them in terms of a, 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 picture, a picture and a video or are we thinking of them in terms of a digital object and how do we apply metadata and stuff to all that? It opens up a whole bunch of questions. And then when you start putting in things like AR and VR and where we're going with that and where that's coming along, uh, we've got to start really thinking, as you said, about those, those flexible things. So, um, We've got to think about scalability too. Um, as you quite rightly say, we were sort of, before we went on air, just talking about the number of video platforms that we've all experienced over the last 18 months. Um, a lot of companies record every single Zoom meeting. Where are you storing those mm -hmm. video things? You know, the scalability <laughs> of that. So that's why a lot of people are, you know, the cloud is a great 
place um, answer to that because it allows us to, to scale up and down the amount of storage capability we need. So in, in terms of rather than actually having to have physical servers on site. So that really helps. Um, and again, really everything we're moving towards is, I like that phrase you just used actually, is, is dynamic. We're really in a very dynamic environment that sometimes grows and sometimes shrinks. And we have to really build the systems and the workflows to, to address that. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, you know, I, I think the answer to anything in a dynamic environment is it depends. I mean, it depends on what's coming in the future and all we can do is try and plan for that and be flexible enough to, to shift as, as things shift around us. Yeah, yeah it, I, I wonder how, how much we actually benefit our users by really going hard into a new format type, to be honest, um, because you always see a massive explosion in proprietary types. You know, we're seeing how many different formats of 3D models there are out there and nobody's going to be supporting them all. But I also see yeah. successful systems out there that can't even render a vector graphic, you know, and, and mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's so I, I, I wonder, but, you know, we're, I'm definitely seeing more calls for, um presenting assets or sets of assets in the dam as if they would be um uh, used in a, in a specialist application so whether it's 3d modeling um which is you know where most people are are um are, you know um are handling these days through some kind of you know blender integration or something um uh, we're seeing um, uh, also uh, photogrammetry, where you know stitching together many many images into a model, uh, into into a shape, uh, and it's it's really about how um, dam users are, are needing us to be able to show them. I mean, part of the reason why DAM is so successful is avoiding the need to download the asset and load it into a specialist application. Um, but how cutting edge we need to be on that, I think we need to listen to our customers. Uh, you know, we're never gonna be as good at um, rendering, you know, 3D, um, you know, CAD as a, as a proper, proper CAD tool. Um, so do, how far do we need to go to be able to preview those assets. Um, and we really need to listen to our customers there. I mean, it is, it is, you know, and I love these conversations, particularly with engineering. Yeah, we've got this new format type, we're gonna create, we're gonna be able to use it. It's wonderful, it's really fun, it's really cool. But are we actually serving our, our, our users and our customers? And that's the important question. Yeah, I think that's actually a very good point, Conrad. You know, as we're seeing the, the, the the growth of dam across the digital enterprise away from not just yep. it not just being a marketing tool but into the you know the product and the, the product development side of things packaging side of things all the way through to e-commerce there's, there's diff, different needs at every one of those stages but they also all need to link together and be able to the, the, the you know the imagery and the, the metadata and everything needs to be able to flow across that and also you know that means different of, um, content models, different data models. Um, so we really need that flexibility across that. Um, but also when it comes to particular data types that can vary by industry. You know, I came out of the, uh, the aerospace industry, a very specifically highly regulated certain uh, types for vector graphics and a certain way of doing them, which really doesn't apply outside of the aerospace industry or the motor industry. You're not seeing that in the marketing department. Um, so you also have to think about, as you said, what's driven by the customer base and where you're actually, um, what the customer's needs within their specific industry, but also what they need across their own digital supply chain and how that, again, relates to their business objectives. So. I've had an interesting experience on the um, being on the business side with an, a new data type. And this was this was years ago now, but it was uh, with a cultural heritage organization I was working with. And they said, you know what we'd, we'd like to do? We'd like to basically recreate kind of the Harry Potter experience where you can walk around our um, museum or our um, cultural heritage space and you can hold up your phone. And when you do, the augmented reality through your phone is going to be able to show you the, the painting moving or talking to you or somehow coming out at you in, in a 3D way. And, and this was pretty revolutionary because this was, um, I would say about maybe six, seven years ago already. So um, back then, you know, the question was that, you know, they came to me and said, can we do this with the dam? Can we store these assets in the dam? And I said, you know, sure, probably. Um, 
But maybe before we talk about where we're going to store the assets, let's talk about how you're going to create these, what, what they're going to be, um, you know, who's going to be involved in that? Are we doing this in-house? Do we have the skills and knowledge in-house or are we, are we bringing in experts from externally? And, and it was really the idea of, of taking this one use case and saying, here's a new use case. And it prompted doing a, a bit of a health check on the dam as well as lots of other systems within the organization to say, <laughs> we want to do this, but can we? Do we have the, the people process and data even before we look at which technology we're going to use for it? Yeah. Well, there are actually plenty of, um, uh, of um, computer game companies using DAM to hold game assets mm -hmm. and to move them around. So that's pretty much the same stuff, right? It's, it's, it's objects that you're going to be representing in a, in a virtual environment. Um, so, yeah, and I, th I think, you know, Alan's exactly right. This, the expansion of DAM into the non-marketing areas is, is immense. Uh, I, I, I actually had a conversation with someone quite a few years ago now about whether we could actually create virtual shops, virtual stores, using assets stored in the dam and the and the and the the um the plans that property were were drawing up to be able to check sight lines and and you know how people would navigate around the store and you know yeah, that's yeah very much a game type situation where you're you know, you're a first person shooter only a first person shopper right moving around the sh moving around the store and i think the 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 uses are are incredible the question is you know as, as, as you said, Christina, where are they coming from? And then, you know, where are they going to? What's actually going to be rendering them? What's going to be building that environment? Because that's probably not something DAM can do very easily um, and is probably best done in a, in a more of a front-end app. You know, Conrad, I, I, think this, I think this also raises the what gives you the night sweats issue that you mentioned a little while ago. <laughs> and that's, yeah. I heard, and I, I, let's flip the coin on that, hold it in a mirror. You know, as we've all, as we know, and the two of you have eloquently said, DAM always sets a taproot somewhere, most commonly in marketing. Eventually, we have all seen someone comes knocking on the door and goes, hi, can I use this over here? And we're seeing a lot of uh, fractures and fault lines where a CMO says, I love DAM. You know, boy, it's doing great things for me. My brand liquidity has been stabilized. I know where my logos are, really simple stuff, but I don't run trade show operations. Mm. And so this brings up significant governance issues. To take your example of uh, um, the, video, the gaming kind of example. So here's a use case from a, a constant thing I was, I'm involved with this week. It's a large manufacturer of food products and they've had their planograms the diagrams that show how things are supposed to be laid out in a retail store, a grocery store, in DAM for a long time. One of the strangest things that goes on in the grocery business is when one supplier comes in and says and moves the ketchup over. And this is not a ketchup manufacturer. I just pulled that name out of the air. So it moves the ketchup over, moves the cereal box over, and then the representative from the ketchup or the cereal maker goes in and goes, what happened to my, my faces? as they're called. Yeah. So this company is now doing a kind of a, an R&D project. Can they use an AI tool to look at the panogram as, planogram as it's supposed to be? And then an image that a sales rep takes in the actual grocery store and says, who moved my ketchup? And <laughs> what an interesting evolution of DAM yes. to go, just, it's just what we wanna be seeing. Yes, there are governance issues, but, how does the damn team hear about it? You know, we don't want the night sweats, right? Um, and, and we want these new technologies coming in and deepening action-centric use of digital asset management. So a really fascinating key off of just what, what both of you have been commenting on. Commenting on. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that we found when we've been working with, with AI is really the power of unlocking what's in the image. You know, traditionally we've, DAM has been a place that we store a finished image and that's mm -hmm. what we think mm -hmm. the asset is, is the image. But actually when you start looking at what's in the image, there is so much business driven information in the image. 
And that when you start linking it to the other business systems, you use AI to mine that and pull the things that are out of the image and start putting and linking those to the business systems. The power of that is really incredible. Uh, yeah. And we see some really massive business benefits from doing that, some UI benefits and, and, and some great, really fascinating use cases around that. Yeah, like tracking uh, corrosion growth on pipelines mm -hmm. and refineries and things like that. Just you know, having having drone footage loaded into the dam and checking before and after to see whether that patch of rust has increased in size. Mm -hmm. There's amazing stuff going on. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think tying dam into the Internet of Things, and of course, one of the one of the interesting companies that does so much in that is there are a lot of SAP tools that take dam and try to commingle it with IoT and action invoked uh, events resulting from that. Mm. Yeah. We, we've just had a question come in, um, which I think is, is really interesting. Um, and I think the Mike who's asking this question may have seen Paul's presentation earlier where Paul was talking about um, his work at, um, with UEFA and, and he was saying that they actually went in and had to uh, archive or get rid of over a million assets um, when they did a review on their dam. And so Mike's asking, um, how do you include a review of digital preservation, particularly of asset formats, but maybe also of just um, archived uh, assets as part of that health check? What do you do with the old, old content? <laughs> nice question. It is a good question. I, I must admit, I shivered then when you said get rid of <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Paul because, didn't specify where where those assets went. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, um, just the idea of deleting content just makes me shiver. Because um, you never know when it can be useful. Um, so yeah, archiving off into some of the deeper archive storages um, that you can do in the cloud is definitely something we've seen a lot more of our customers doing. You know, they don't they don't need every asset to be like instantly available like it is through there. You know, it can be in an archive where maybe you have to wait two or three minutes or a minute or whatever to get it back. Um, and that's, that tends to be a lower cost storage than actually keeping it in the DAM. Um, and then using the DAM to actually, you know, index it, know it's in the deep archive. And if you need it, it can go find it and retrieve it. And it takes a little longer, but you know, so you've got a bit of a latency issue, but you've got lower costs and you can keep the stuff and you're not getting rid of it. And, and we found particularly during the lockdown period when uh, a lot of our clients, um, you know, had to close down their photo studios or couldn't go out and shoot new video or whatever, you know, um, that they were actually really mining their archives to build marketing campaigns to keep them um, relevant. Um, there's a really great one where uh, one of our sporting good uh, customers went out um, and took 4,000, I think it was like 4,000 uh, hours of, of um, video and, and used AI and helped to mine that to put together a really great 28 second commercial that basically said we're still playing sports we may be on lockdown but sports are still important and we're, you know we're all together type thing and it, it and, mm. and it was a great merge and editing job we got a, another one who um was going through uh, and realized that they had um in their archives whole old campaigns from the 1960s with which featured a, a very famous movie star of that period. And it's like, well, why don't we do a retro campaign? So they pulled all that stuff out and did a whole retro marketing campaign based on assets that had been originally done in the 1960s as photographs and paintings that had been digitized and put in the dam just as a place to put them, pretty much forgotten about. And it's like, hey, mm -hmm. we've got these really useful assets in our archives, let's pull them in, bring them, digitize them um, and so you know yeah you can take those assets and apply things like AI and digitization and coloring and all the great stuff that you can do in you know the creative um, platforms these days um, and bring them forward so ar archiving for me is, 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 is a very important part of, of the damn process I think and uh, there is a great deal of value in the stuff that is in the archives if you so as part of your health check to actually get around to answering your question, yeah, I think you should look at what's in your archive. And again, think about how that relates to, is that something we can be using today? Um, is that something we can be leveraging today? Um, I, I, yeah, so I could yeah. go on on that for different hours, as you can probably tell. Um, A whole new use case. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Conrad, do you want to add something in before we wrap up? 
Um, sure. In in that case, I'd like to you know think about why you want to remove it, and you know there's there's there are some good reasons to remove to remove stuff to to take it out. Firstly, if it if it's just straight duplication, you know, and there's no reason to keep it. Absolutely. Um, if you don't have the right to use it anymore, or if it's stuff that you really shouldn't be using because it's out of date for that reason, hide it. Don't, 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 um, don't kill it. Don't, don't delete it. Hide it because you never know when you'll want to use it again. But the real killer is: is it impacting the user experience? Is it making it harder for people to find relevant stuff because they're drowned in a bunch of stuff that that is is less relevant? And then it's down to potentially security, potentially you know re um, uh, restricting the view of that. Um, but making it making it visible through another thing, another way, uh, and making sure that your metadata and search is supporting the latest rele relevant assets, and making sure that you're not impacting the speed with which people can retrieve what they need, because you've got a million other assets that are hanging about. Yeah, can I just pick up on that point about the uh, you know is it causing a bad user experience? It might be it's the right asset used in the wrong place. The relevance thing that you were just talking about, Conrad, because yeah. the metadata is wrong or you're delivering something. So rather, you know, not necessarily delete it, but take a look at it and say, oh, you know, are we using this? Could this actually be, get a better result if it's used somewhere else or is it applied to a different audience or whatever? So uh, that comes again back to doing the metadata checks and making sure that you're delivering the, the, the right image to the right customers at the right time and for what they need. Brilliant. Well, we do have to wrap up, sadly. I know we could keep talking about this for, for a very long time. And um, if anyone does have any specific questions for any one of us, feel free to reach out on the platform. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Conrad, Alan, um, for joining David and I today and talking about health checks and the importance of keeping your dam going and keeping it growing um, through the years uh, and keeping up with all of the new use cases. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure, yeah. And um, for the audience, up next, you've got on track one, you've got Evoke Films for future-proofing video archives and the role of dam. And on track two, uh, you can join Life Picture Collection for using AI to empower creativity and to bring archives to life. Thank you all and have a wonderful day. <laughs>